Who is Robert Romani? Seriously, that's the first question you start with? How the f am I supposed to summate that? I'd say it started right around the time I was 13 years old. I just come off my uh, bar mitzvah and um, I had a big obsession with Jordan shoes and Nike shoes and all these just extra clothes and gear that they would sell with all these celebrities I would wear. And uh, I came from a position in the family that we weren't financially that sound. So we couldn't just go and splurge thousands of dollars on Jordan shoes and things that I loved and I saw on TV, so I t decided to take it upon myself to go ahead and start my shoe company, or my shoe hobby that turned into a company for the first time. Uh, I would see that there was Jordan shoes selling uh, for more than retail price on eBay, um, and they would sell them at the stores for say $125, and then uh, I figured out that, hey, if you buy them for $125 at the store, you can sell them back online for $250. So it kind of made like financial sense where, well, if I can buy this shoe and sell for $125, then I can buy the shoe practically for free because I'm just make, using the money that I made to buy something I wanted. One thing led to another and I collected over a, say five or six year span, over 150, 200 shoes. And I sold that company for uh, over $150,000. I actually dropped out of high school. Um, it was during the years I should have been in high school, but I dropped out in 11th grade. Uh, school wasn't for me, to, to put it wisely. I didn't really take school seriously. I never really got in tune with learning from you know academics and books, and it just it wasn't my thing. I wasn't in school, and I was trying to figure myself out, and uh, I actually invested in stocks. I was day trading. I would buy and sell stocks every single day. Um, I'd wake up at like 5 a.m. and uh, invest in stocks and I was doing pretty good for a while until I got my ass handed to me. Uh, I cried practically every single day for a month, morning and night. I was so upset at myself that I worked so hard to create what I thought was at the time the most amount of money I could ever make in my life, but it was honestly the most valuable lesson I've ever had. It was worth every dollar to lose because I still think about it to this day. Anything that comes too easy isn't going to last too long and that you need to grind every single day if you truly want to be successful and if you think you're just going to get lucky and get a quick hit. Uh, I'm sure there's people that are like that, but the vast majority are not. So it taught me how to have work ethic and make sure that anything I invested in going forward was an absolute win and I would have no chance to lose. Ever since I was a kid, I've always been blessed with seeing numbers. My English sucked, my writing sucked, but when it came to numbers, I've always been gifted. And I realized that at a very young age. I, I just, I loved calculating mathematical equations as a kid and loved finance and numbers and it was just, it was my thing. So I took a liking into commercial real estate and dug into it a little bit more and decided to, to go work for the summer to try to uh, see how I liked real estate. And they were predominantly doing more commercial real estate management of properties. I definitely learned that that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a developer and spread my wings and buy properties across the nation and have this dream in the back of my head of owning as many properties as I could. So it became like a hobby for me to find properties in new markets that I could travel to explore in new areas and also buy new assets. So typically brokers at that time, we had like a really, it was a really antiquated system of Google Maps. So like you'd see a property online, you'd find a property that you liked, but then the only way to see it was through like Google Maps or Google Earth. And back in the day, Google Maps was like super grainy, so you couldn't see the property. So you'd have to fly out to see the asset. My first property I ever bought was actually in Atlanta. It wasn't even in Southern California. So after I got my first taste of buying a property, I spent my entire like, life in making sure it succeeded because I had that constant burn uh, in the back of my in my back of my throat of like hey this is much bigger stakes you got your ass handed to you in, in stocks you better not let that happen again so I decided to uh, move out to Atlanta like every uh, month I'll go out there for a couple weeks um, and again this was a difficult time to lease spaces because of the Great Recession so a trick that I kind of created for myself was how I can you know buy off tenants in a way so I'll go block to block corner to corner and I'll be banging on tenants doors and say hey look I bought this new property it's exciting there was a Dunkin Donuts in there um, after enough hard work and and enough door banging I finally got the one person so I was able to get Jimmy John's uh, franchisee to come open up in that, that space within the first two months of buying the property. After I got the confidence in that property, um, 
Atlanta was something I got super excited about just because I'm like, oh, well, I did a great job. Atlanta must be lucky for me. I bought this uh, Rite Aid building and I was looking at this building like, okay, well, how are you gonna fill up a 12,000 square foot empty box whenever everyone's closing stores? So I had this idea of, hey, let's put some pretty renderings and photos and a plan together of like trying to get a drive through because drive throughs were still popular at that time. Now, while the deal didn't happen in the first four months, it took a little bit longer than that, we ended up uh, landing Chick-fil-A. While that happened, it was super exciting. I bought that property actually for about a million dollars around that time and I ended up selling it for about 2.2 million within a couple years. So it was quite the gain, and again, that further boosted my confidence um, in the, the real estate industry. My constant comment in my own head is, good job, bravo, Robert, you did this, but what can you do at the next level? And I kept going and going and going. I expanded to markets like Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, Texas, uh, Nevada, Arizona. So. At one point, I think I was at like 10 or 11 different states. It was at times really sad sleeping in a, in a motel by yourself on the, on the weekend and saying, why am I doing this? Um, when you're seeing friends having fun and, and partying. And then in order to get through these more difficult times, it's best to have a, a partner. Because I'll travel to like Dallas or, or Houston and I'm like, well, there's all these great restaurants and, and things to go to. I wish I had somebody that was with me. So I was lucky enough when I was in my younger 20s to meet um, uh, my wife, Crystal. She was young and she was uh, in dietitian school and it became an experience. So like we would go look at a property in Dallas and then we'd go to like a Dallas Mavericks game and go to like nice restaurants. And we, it wouldn't just be about work and just being like working and then going home and sleeping. It was like after that point, it transitioned to being work, work, work to work hard, play hard. And it was like a happy balance of the two. So Crystal Cove Commons was the most expansive and difficult project I'd ever worked on because it was just so vast and large and it wasn't as simple as buying a 10, 20,000 square foot property where you only needed three, four tenants. This property was over, you know, eight acres. It had maybe 75 tenants and I had to develop a plan to how to turn this property back to its former glory. I was nervous. I, I'm not going to sit here and say I was super confident when I'm like, okay, I'm going to crush this. I was terrified. I literally stayed at the property for, I think, two weeks, visiting it every day. The typical Robert at the time would try to figure out the most cost-effective way to get a remodel done. Um, but I knew that this property was special, that if I spent that extra, you know, couple hundreds of thousands of dollars, that I could take this property to the next level, and that was what would be needed to attract customers from these newer properties that were already in the area to come back to here. So um, when I finally remodeled this property, I went with a super modern property on the water and I was praying that, you know, customers and consumers would love this and it actually worked out really well. So the leasing started off slow because it takes customers to change their habits to be able to say, okay, well, I'm not going to this area that's a mile away. I want to check out this new property. The only way that happens is by incentivizing new tenants to come so customers have a reason to come. So right off the bat, I was able to sign, you know, a, a new high-end Italian restaurant. I was able to sign a fitness center, uh, a tenant that, that uh, sells yachts. So the property now as it sits today is over 90% occupied. Um, it's actually currently for sale as well. Um, and we did very, very well with that project. And that led me to saying like, you know, I love to be able to create experiences. My passion is in creating shopping experiences, my passion is in creating dining experiences. So in knowing that, that's, that, that's what led me to buy uh, my newer properties, my newer acquisitions. Whenever you're in the shopping center industry, there's neighborhood shopping centers, there's grocery anchor shopping centers, there's strip centers, then there's power centers. So I'd say for any, or at least for myself, your, your goal was always to own a power center, one of these large block to block, just dominant centers. What I did was I just started approaching as many brokers as possible and saying, hey, situation's bad right now. Retail doesn't look too positive. Um, I'm willing to take your properties off your hands, but at a, at a much steeper discount. 
So I kind of use my, my Jordan shoe strategy of just, you know, try to buy cheaper and then sell for more and make that spread and that profit. And I probably knocked on a hundred doors for brokers to see if somebody would, would sell a deal. And it was, it was pretty difficult and I wasn't able to find it. One broker finally said that, hey, I have this potential deal that could work. This property was Oracle Wetmore, which I own today. It's a 150,000 square foot shopping center in Tucson, Arizona. Um, the property once upon a time was probably worth in the around 55, 60 million dollars and I was able to pick it up for 38 million. The property is 99% occupied and has national chains like Chipotle and Jamba Juice and Alta Beauty and Walgreens. So it was truly a gem um, that I just got into a situation where I was able to buy a property at a discounted price. The little old Black Lion group that started in Atlanta was able to take a property down like that. It was an achievement that still to this day gives me goosebumps and makes me feel like Bravo, Robert, you're able to do something that not in your wildest imagination you're able to do. When I would develop these projects, they would be fun, but I, w I knew there was something more. I knew there was something bigger. I knew there was uh, something more grand. And when I first went to Miami, when I was about 23 years old, I just fell in love. The water, the high rises, the buildings. Now, I thought like, oh, I'm this cool kid on the block. I built some things and designed some things in Atlanta and Chicago and Texas, and that's great. But when I got to Miami, I'm like, damn. Like, they're building high rises this big. Because when you come from LA, there's high rises, but they're in downtown and no one really goes and it's not that big of a deal. And when you go to Texas, there's some, but they're not really exciting. But when you go to Miami and you see all those high rises in uh, downtown or in Brickell, or, and then you see the water and they're on the waterfront, it, it blew my mind away. I think a lot of people always thought Miami is just being a vacation market where people just go for the, the winter months when other mar markets are super cold. I mean, granted, the hurricanes suck. Humidity is horrible. Um, but when you really get into the city, you realize how alive it is. I mean, you've got everything around you. Um, it's super close to Europe, to a lot of the islands in Bahamas and whatnot. It's great for partying. It's great for dining. People stay out late. It's not like Los Angeles where you go out and alcohol stops at two and people don't even want to go out because there's no point. Like Miami is alive 24 seven. That led me to just want to focus all my time there because through the, especially through the pandemic when a lot of other markets were hurting like Los Angeles just due to governmental regulations of not being able to have businesses open, Miami was flourishing. The restrictions were lifted, people were out partying, drinking, shopping, going to sports events, and it was a lot more lenient, which when people started to see that, this synergy across the entire city, especially with the mayor and what he's doing now, trying to bring all these tech companies from, from San Francisco, that it's alive. All these macroeconomic effects really made Miami the hot spot to be. So recently, um, I just purchased a, a super exciting property, which is a, a Mar at Paraiso. It's the one of the probably only freestanding waterfront properties in the Miami market um, that is literally 15 feet from the water. And it has a, a super famous James Beard award winning chef. Uh, Michael Schwartz, he's operating that restaurant. And it was just something that's a one of a kind trophy property that I know the long term value, no matter who it is, is only going to get better and better. And it's a staple in the community. It's more of an experience and a brand. And that's what's super important going forward that Black Lion becomes a brand that when you lease a Black Lion property or you're going to shop or eat at a Black Lion property, that you know you're getting a, a, a different experience that others are providing and it's just gonna be badass. As most of my friends know me, I like to throw parties two, three times a year. And all those parties are an experience that nobody forgets, including my wedding, where I threw a Harry Potter wedding. And people are like, oh, what do you mean Harry Potter wedding? And I just like to be goofy and different like that. So my properties are gonna be a resemblance of what my vision is for that specific submarket. This excitement for Miami has sparked me into wanting to spread my wings further. A super exciting project in uh, Wynwood. And Wynwood is like this super trendy, 
up and coming, super artistic kind of vibe. And a lot of people just don't know about it because it's just, it's, it's fairly new. This is gonna be Black Lion's chance to change up some things. We're super excited about this new jungle vibe we're gonna to add to this property. What I know the value that I bring is that I look at a property and I wanna give an experience that nobody else has seen before. So for this Winwood project, no one's really done uh, a jungle meets Tulum meets like Avatar vibe. So all these new projects going forward are going to be an experience, not just to come eat and, and shop at a property, but I want it to be that moment that when you go on Instagram, when you go on Snapchat, that there's that special stamp that this is a black line project. That it's more than just how can I get the highest rent, it's more of an experience and a brand. Castle Bravani is a bit of my wife's and I journey and passion. So there's certain rooms that are like a forest room. There's certain rooms that are dedicated to like a Harry Potter room that there's an apothecary in. And then when you go outside, there's, you know, Alice in Wonderland kind of vibes where it's super open and bright and happy and colorful. Um, so each part of the house has a piece of me in it. I've always been a big fan of like transformers or like mythical kind of creation. So one time during the pandemic, uh, Chris and I'm like, okay, we just need to get out of LA. We're losing our minds. So we go to Vegas. And like most genius ideas of mine, it usually begins with a, a margarita or a cocktail of some sort. So we're like, okay, let's just get hammered at the Las Vegas Venetian shops and let's, let's just drink and walk around um, the shops. And I walk in and I see this like 12 foot statue that I don't even know what you want to call that he looks like. And I just fell in love. I'm like, okay, I have to have this, bring it to the house. So I sit there and bargain with a guy who's like, okay, well the statue's $75,000. I'm like, come on, it's COVID. Nobody's going to buy a statue. So my instinct of real estate negotiation came in. I was able to get it at a great price. Uh, but I think he actually suckered me instead of buying one and I ended up buying two. So I don't know who won that negotiation, but I ended up getting two statues and I call them the protectors of Castle Ravani. One of the other names is Katsumoto, the other one, is Achilles. So one of the favorite movies, Last Samurai, where Katsumoto came from, and Troy, um, where Achilles is, is portrayed. And they're like my fictional savior figures that I, I looked up to growing up. So one day my wife decides to tell me that, hey Robert, um, I love this whole castle vibe that you have going on, even though we practically almost got divorced over me remodeling the house, because she wanted it in pretty girl colors in her way, but I'm like, it's not happening. So she's like, fine, I want to make a portrait of ourselves. I said, okay, fine. So I was assuming she just wants to take a picture and do a portrait. Little did I know, she's taking me to a costume rental company in North Hollywood, where I'm literally putting on the Game of Thrones outfits and dressing up for like an hour in this heavy ass armor. It was just one of those experiences that were pretty awesome. So we ended up getting the portrait and we put it on top of the Game of Thrones chair to resemble that where the, the king and queen of Castle Ravani and it's just something that we look at on a daily basis and, and, and love. So I'm happy she pushed me to do it, but it was a uh, interesting experience to say the least. So I've been dealing with a, a myriad of health problems ever since my young 20s. Um, I just didn't pay too much attention to them. And so as my stress got increasingly higher, I started to see a lot of things start in my body start to not go the right way. I ended up developing thyroid disease and a bunch of GI issues and I kept wondering why I was having all these mysterious ailments. I mean I know I was hyper stressed but I mean nowadays who isn't super stressed um, until I was diagnosed with Lyme disease in 2018 and that was a huge hit to, it was partial excitement to know what was wrong with me but also a huge hit to know that this is going to potentially be a lifelong battle. Five years um, of my life um, I was getting different types of alternative treatments like blood transfusions with ozone and shots all throughout my body and different types of antibiotics and suffering and throwing up in the middle of the night and it was it was very difficult it was very difficult but at the end of the day i would ask myself do you want to just sit in misery and suffer all the time or do you want to continue to try to leave a legacy behind and something that was just that that continued to stick with me was that just not giving up, 
I still deal with it today. I still deal with the, the pain and suffering today, but I've, I've been able to manage it a lot better. My answer to who is Robert Ravani is not Robert Ravani is a singular thing, because I think any person that tries to put themselves in a singular thing is a very unintelligent way to do it. Robert Ravani is an evolution of his surroundings. And as my surroundings continue to get more and more vast, I continue to, to grow. And I think any person that doesn't take these experiences of traveling and dining and going out and about and make them into who they are and be able to re-express that to others and recreate that vision that you've seen and portray that upon other people, you're missing out on life. My long-term vision for Blackline and myself is to create these uh, amazing commercial properties whether they're shopping centers or waterfront destinations, pairing up with great restaurateurs and chefs to make these one-of-a-kind properties that no matter where you go in the world, you can't replicate it. And that's what truly makes me excited now.